just say this. I, I was saying to him yesterday, you're the kid who sat in the back of the church and wanted nothing to do with, with church. And in the last few years, his faith is, uh, in God has exploded. And uh, so he's going to talk to you about being a Christian in the military and being a single person in particular uh, and Christian in the military and in the world. So without further ado, thank you. Yeah. So again, I'm uh, Nick, coming from Paducah, Kentucky. I've been in the Coast Guard for a little over four years now. Um, and I was talking with my dad yesterday about about this. I've only taught uh, this lesson, and I, I titled it The Challenge of Christianity. Um, so I, I, I talk with my dad constantly about struggles that I face, that I have faced, um, and things that I've, I've tried to do about them, things, you know, like, hey, dad, I'm struggling with this in the military. These guys say this, they do that. What do I do? And he, as I was talking with him about this lesson, um, he being the better public speaker than I, was like, well, Nick, maybe you should give everyone some background information on yourself as far as where you've come from, uh, what you were like before uh, you met God, then kind of go from there. So before uh, I was a born-again Christian, I would, I would say that it's hard for me to tell when exactly the transition happened. Uh, my dad has told me that there are two ways people are coming to the kingdom of God. You're either zapped or you're oozed. And I have definitely been oozed into the kingdom. But I know what I was like beforehand. Uh, I was very, very angry all the time. Um, very self-obsessed where, well, it's the world versus me. It's, uh, it's all about what, what I can get out of the world, what I can get out of people. Um, it would kind of be like, well, if you're not on the same page as me, then you kind of get out of my way. Um, and I had uh, a lot of struggles with, uh, with depression. There was a time when I was a freshman in high school that I had uh, very, very strong thoughts of suicide. Um, and it was, it was just really hard. I had difficulty making friends, difficulty keeping friends, just because of the attitude that I had um, with people. And like my dad said, I'd always sit in the very back of the church, uh, would never pay attention to any sermons, anything whatsoever that he had to say. <laughs> I'd, it'd be more or less, you know, if I, you know, looking at the watch, when can I, when can I leave? Which was, uh, as a side note, which was the exact opposite of my brother. He would always sit in the very, very front, and it was just really easy for him to make friends with anyone that was there. And when anyone would try and come talk to me, uh, I would just immediately push him away, like, I don't want to have a conversation about church because you're in church, so we're only going to talk about church. That's what people are like. That's the mentality that I had. They didn't want to know about me. Um, and then sometime around junior or senior year in high school, uh, I took a round turn. I don't, I don't know what it was, um, but I just decided I needed to make a change in my life. And I started taking reading the Bible a lot more serious. And I'll share this with you. I latched on to uh, my favorite psalm in the Bible. I use this for, I mean, I share this with almost everyone I talk to about. Well, what, what did you, you know, what was the first thing you read in the Bible that really uh, kind of spoke out to you? So if you don't mind, I'll read it to you real quick. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will, be, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their, when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. The, uh, and every time I would get angry, I would start thinking about the Psalm 4, verse 3. It's the second part of that. It says, the Lord hears when I call to him that every time that I need something, I can call on God to make it better. 
And so I then entered the, the Coast Guard in 2009 when I graduated high school and I hit a pretty big stumbling block because um, I went, it's a completely different world, the military is, it really is. And the people that uh, you're surrounded with really can kind of challenge you to your core as to what you believe, uh, who you want to be as a person, whether it be um, the jokes that they make, the, their values, their ethics, their morals, can kind of be just outlandish um, compared to what I was used to. And it's not against anything as them as a person, so we're all raised differently, we're all taught differently. So it was just kind of a culture shock when I went into it. So, you know, as far as how I stumbled, you know, I started having a, my language deteriorated very, very quickly. Um, and it's still something I struggle with a lot today just because of the environment. You know, I can make excuses, but um, just because of the environment that you're in. Um, you know, the thinking that some things were okay when they're not, um, whether it be, you know, they were saying, like, people have conversations with me, like, oh, I think I'm going to, you know, plan to go out and, you know, try and sleep with, you know, all sorts of different women or this or that. Instead of saying, hey, you know, maybe you shouldn't do that, just kind of taking a back seat in the car when something should be said. And I met a guy named Joe Rothenberg, who uh, is a warrior for God, and him and I just kind of, took a, him leading the way, kind of took a stand and saying, no, we're going to just kind of be Christians here regardless of what people think. And thank, thankfully for him, when I moved to Paducah, I kept that same mentality um, that I'm not, I was not going to let, you know, even, even if I was the only Christian there, you guys are not going to change my mind on who I am, who Jesus is, and what I stand for. So when I got there, I decided to start a Bible study. Um, didn't really know the direction I was going to go with it. I'd never done any Bible study ever in my life before. I'd never taught anyone anything. So uh, let alone, you know, my peers. It was, it was terrifying, but it, it went really, really well. And then uh, last April, uh, I called, or before then, I called my dad. I said, Dad, you know, I don't really remember much about being you know, baptized because, you know, I was dedicated as a child, but I wanted to have some sort of memory as far as, uh, you know, my declaration of faith. So I said, how do I get confirmed? And April 7th last year, I got confirmed. So the life that I have now, like I said, all the Bible studies, I read the Bible almost daily, um, and I know what I stand for rather than backing down from conversations with people at work when they're like, oh, I'm going to go do this or this, and they kind of look at me for, oh, well, what are your thoughts? And I'm like, well, I think that's stupid. I think you shouldn't do that. <laughs> I mean, tell them, tell them, like, tell it to them like it is. Um, and the focus, the, the, and the big thing that I'll hit on at the end of this is there's a balance that we have to have between intimacy with God versus intimacy with people. And compromising the wrong way is what gets us into trouble. So, with that, the first part of, the thing of what I'd like to talk about are the friends. So like I told you, when, and even so today, I struggled making friends. Um, and part of that problem occurred to me is because when in the churches that I would go to, no one was my age. So, not to say that it's, it's you can't have a friend that's not your age. That's not what I'm getting at. But there's some, it's difficult for me to, to always be able to relate to like, oh, hey, you know, you want to go do this, do this, or this, because it's, it's natural. We want to talk to someone that can relate to what we're struggling with at the time. So, what do we do? Um, the people I work with, there are no Christians my age whatsoever. I have one guy that's a Mormon, one guy that says he's a Christian, and one guy that says he's an atheist. So, 
a vast array of, of belief systems that exist in there. The mistake, I think, is to say that, well, since you're not a Christian, I'm going to stop talking to you. I think that's, it's, one, it's not practical because if you work with someone eight hours a day, plus more, you're going to have to talk to them. Secondly, it's not biblical. And third, you're probably going to lose your mind if you don't talk to someone. So the issue that you come up with is what are some things that we, some issues that we face <coughs> with people that are not Christians? And this is where I'm going to ask you guys to list some things. So what are some problems that we face when, in conversation and social settings with people that are not Christians? What are some issues? They tell you that when everything's wrong with the world, that your God should fix it. God should, God should fix everything, right? Or your God is mean. God is mean. You should fix it. What else? It's a good one. What's that? The football game's on. Why do you want to go to football? The football game's on. Why is God important? <laughs> Which impacts you on well. It's a struggle. <laughs> Usually not a problem on Sunday. So these can be some of as a difference you can have in a difference in religion.
and her dad was a Methodist. Two completely different sides of the spectrum. And I've talked to her more about faith than any other person in the entire office, and any Christian that I've met in Paducah. And one of the things that she said that was amazing to me was that, you know, Nick, you're the first Christian I've ever met that didn't tell me I'm going to hell within the first five minutes of, of talking to me. That's incredible. That as Christians, I'm not saying, you know, hell doesn't exist or that, you know, Jesus isn't the only way of salvation, but if you if you lead a conversation with telling someone that they're going to go to hell, you're not going to get very far. You're probably going to get nowhere. You're not going to develop a relationship with that person to where they want to hear what you have to say. So, knowing that here are some problems that we face with talking with non-believers and sometimes believers in general, there are some things that we can do to mitigate those roadblocks. Um, so, what I'd like to get your guys' opinion on is what are some definitions of tolerance? What does tolerance mean? Being respectful. I'm sorry. So, being respectful. Being respectful. Respectful. Yes, ma'am. I said you you agree to disagree. Agree to disagree. I think the foundation of uh, tolerance is uh, love my neighbor. Love my neighbor. track too much, but the thing about tolerance, mm -hmm. in order to tolerate something, you have to disagree with it. Yes. And I don't think that's what a lot of people mean by tolerance. Yes. We must disagree. So, tolerance. The, uh, a lot of the examples I've heard of tolerance and when I've asked people, what do you think tolerance means? Or what does society tell us tolerance means? It means, well, if someone has a different opinion than you, then you just don't say anything, you tell them it's perfectly fine, that nope, whatever's good for you is good for you. That's being tolerant. Absolutely not. The why we're done for tolerance is the ability to disagree with someone and still maintain a relationship afterwards. So if you go into a conversation and you're like, well, I totally don't agree with the word you just said, but you don't say anything, that's not being tolerant. You know, there's a, a certain tact that does need to be used when you start getting into a conversation of merit, a conversation of priorities values, differences, um, but like I said, the mistake is to say like, well, you're completely wrong, I hate that, that's stupid, this or this. Instead, when someone's, like when people, for example, the woman that sits across from me starts telling me what her mom believes, even though I'm like, wow, that's completely outlandish. Instead of saying that, it's probably better for me to say, well, tell me some more about what, th what that means. What does that mean? What is this? What is this? Get some actual information from the person so, I genuinely care about what she has to say. Regardless of whether I think it's completely like crazy or not, I still care about what she has to say. She's putting trust in me to listen to what she has to say. And then at the end of the day, if you've done that, then you can be like, okay, well, do you mind if I tell you my opinions about the same thing, which is where you now open up an avenue to talk about Jesus, which is what we want to do. So, it's important that we do what we want. I'm sorry. It's important that we try and live with peace, live at, live peacefully with everyone. The uh, little verse for that. I don't know if you guys can write it down. I don't know if you have papers. 
Romans 12, 17 through 18. It says, do not repay evil for repay evil for evil, but do your best to live at peace with everyone. So doing so means we know what being tolerant means. Three things that I have as far as to mitigate your road, mitigate the roadblocks. First, establish yourself. It's easy when you enter into a friendship, relationship, whatever, that you don't want to make waves with people. You don't want to be like, well, uh, if I say this, then they're, they're not gonna they're not gonna trust me. They're not gonna talk to me. So if you don't want to make waves, you have to ask yourself: Are you living authentically? Um, if you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. That's what the you know, famous quote says. So you have, you need to make sure, just as I you know, just this applies to me as well. Like we stand for what we believe in, and a big part of that is what's on your mind. Romans eight five, you know, it says, you know, the mind that's of the body is has his mind set on the flesh, but a body that's of the spirit has mind set on what the spirit desires. So when you're living your life, what is your mind on? Is it on God? When you're in conversations with people that don't agree with you, what's your mind on? Well, I want them to accept me, or I want Jesus to accept me. That's going to determine whether the Holy Spirit is speaking through you, or it's you speaking through you. We want the latter to not happen. Secondly, I think this one's probably hit on the least, so we have establish yourself. Secondly, pray. This is a, in my opinion, this is a lost art. Prayer. For us to be prepared, we need and we want God's help. If if I decide, okay, well, I've been sitting in my apartment by myself for the past uh, 16 weeks, and these guys finally invited me to go out to, you know, wherever it is, and I decide I want to go because I'm literally so bored that I, you know, I'm just going to, I've walked around the apartment, literally this has happened to me, I've walked around the apartment so many times, so I'm like, I need to leave right now, or I'm going to go insane. So you go, but the mistake is to think that, well, I'm, I'm going to go there. I'm going to be fine on my own. We want to God to go. We want God with us at the entire time. And you never know if God's going to open up an avenue to you say something. First Peter chapter three verses fifteen to seventeen. Again, I'm, I'm summarizing the best I can. It says, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. If you go into a conversation and they're like, well, you know, I know. Uh, that you're a Christian, but I don't really know much about it. Can you tell me something about it? If you don't know what to say, missed opportunity right there. Now, a little quiz for you guys. We pray so we can put on the full armor of God. What are some, some parts of the armor of God? The helmet of righteousness. Uh, helmet, helmet of salvation. Oh, salvation. Shield. Someone say shield. We didn't know we were going to take a test. It's going to be a test. This is your sermon on this. Being strong in your faith. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, that. Yeah, that's definitely. Yeah, that's basically that's what the, the armor of God is. You have the helmet of salvation. That's what you have. Yeah, basically that's what the the armor of God is. You have. The helmet of salvation, the shield of faith, sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, feet fitted with the readiness from the gospel of peace, breastplate of righteousness, and the belt of truth. If you're curious, this is Ephesians chapter 6, verses uh, 10 through 18. That's a huge part of what it is to be a Christian daily, is to put on that full armor of God. And that's how you're prepared for the situations that come in life in general is to be prepared daily. Something that, I mean, something that I've tried, this, and the third thing, something that I've tried more and more uh, recently, and uh, it's not as big as the other ones. Uh, 
Christian themed clothing. So, sure, so like the one I have on right now, uh, and it may, it may, you may think it's silly, you may think it's like, well, I didn't want to do that. But I can tell you that I remember the first time that I, uh, you know, I decided, okay, I'm going to buy a T-shirt that's you know not of this world. It, it's uh, it's a website, you know, I bought one. Went into uh, the gym the next day, and people like that, you see because some of the lettering is small, and you see people just kind of look at trying to look at your shirt, and you're like, what is it? What does it say? And then I'm like, oh, I'm glad you asked. Well, actually, it says this, not of this world, you know, John 17, 16, and it's this and this and this. And then, you know, you get a shirt like this where if they look at the back, it's very, very in your face, like, oh, well, obviously, this guy's Christian. It says, you know, that's, I know that's, everyone knows what a Bible verse says, that, you know, for the most part. Um, and I've seen people literally change their word choice Based on this, seeing the seated, you know, they see a shirt that you may have on. Um, there was one time I was in the office, and uh, one of the guys was making, you know, a, a joke, which was in very bad taste. Walk, walked in, and then he, I hadn't even said anything, hadn't even looked at him. He saw the back of the shirt, and I turned around and looked, and he, it's like he had a mental block in his mind of, okay, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. And it wasn't that I didn't, I didn't even say anything. I didn't even know what the joke was about. But I could tell that something had changed his mind. And that would be conviction. That would be the Holy Spirit doing its work that it's supposed to do, convicting the heart, saving souls. So the third part in all of this is what I call the reality check. So like I said at the beginning, there are two forces that fight, at least I know that they fight within me, and I think they fight within most people. That's intimacy versus God with God versus intimacy with people. God versus The biggest mistake that I make, and that I think everyone that's a Christian can make, is saying that, well, God's not doing it for me, so I'm going to try and do it myself. I'm going to conform to what the people around me are doing. And, okay, let's, let's say you do that. Let's say we do that. Maybe you get the friends. Maybe, you know, as the saying goes, you get the girl, whatever. But you've compromised and conformed and lost everything that you had to begin with. There's a fascinating, uh, I was talking with my dad about this yesterday, it's almost like paradoxical when uh, in Matthew, Jesus says that, you know, if you love me, you must, you know, hate your father, hate your brother, hate your mother, all these things, saying basically uh, the point Jesus is making is that you need to love me first and not cling to all of these other people. But what happens is that as we allow the Holy Spirit to come into our life and work through us, our relationships with other people grow stronger. And the relationships that grow stronger are the ones that are going to last. And that's because we didn't sacrifice intimacy with God. We let intim intimacy with God come first, and then God did the work that he promised. You know, follow me first, and I will give you the desires of your heart. That's what comes second. That has to. And if you're like me, you, you may struggle with knowing what God's will for your life is. If you do, look at Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. So, if you want to know what you're supposed to do in life, you want to know what direction you're supposed to go. You need to look, take a, 
and I do constantly, and I'm, I still have to do, you need to take a hard look at Romans 12, 1 and 2, and ask yourself, is, am I sacrificing everything for God? That's not an easy task to do whatsoever, but don't conform, don't give up intimacy with God for intimacy with people. Let God come first in the second, and intimacy with people will come in God's time. Secondly, there are some things that uh, we value in friendships just like we do in a relationship. So, in your friendships, what are some things that we value? Values on friendships. What are some things that you look for in a friendship? Honesty. Honesty. What else? Loyalty. I'm sorry? Huh? Loyalty. Loyalty, absolutely. Okay, Give one more. Communi yeah, communication. Communication, sure. Good communication. So, these are things that we want in friendships, so why should we compromise, honey? You know, when, when uh, you think about, oh, the, the person that I want to get married to, well, they have to be, you know, I, the people I talk to at work, one guy in particular is like, well, she has to be like this, 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 this. And I'm just like, dude, I mean, are you, are you serious right now? Like, <laughs> it's just, a, it's a joke. But at the same time, something can be said about, something to take away from that is to be like, okay, well, if I'm going to set my standards up here for the person I want to marry, why should my standards come down for the person I want to be my friend? You know, if a friendship is built completely upon tearing someone down, completely upon making jokes about, about them, is that really a friendship? Is that something that you value? The, uh, I'll tell you, a lot of the people, a lot of the way the military people work is, well, I'm your friend, I'll do anything for you. Except, well, the entire day we're just making jokes about each other, the, literally the entire day. I've had, I've had years of that. And it's just, there's, there's no, I don't talk to any of those guys anymore. The one, the couple people I do talk to are the ones where the friendship was based upon what can I do to help you? What can I do to make your life better? That's the friendship that matters, that's the one that we should care about. So, living for Jesus requires us to devote ourselves to Him entirely. And, again, that is, term, Jesus reminds us, you know, John 17, 16, He's praying for uh, His disciples. He says, you know, Father, protect them, for they are not of this world, just as I am out of it. And, in closing, something to encourage you, uh, John 16, 33, Jesus is saying, you know, in this world you may face trials, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. So, that same power that Jesus had, thankfully, he sent us in his Holy Spirit. So be encouraged by that. Don't conform to what the world has to tell you. Take heart and know that it's been overcome. Any questions? Comments, concerns? Uh, thank you very much. For, yes? I do. Um, the lifestyle that you are promoting. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about being bored in your apartment. Mm -hmm. um, how do you deal with the loneliness? Um, because that you, sometimes oh, God doesn't just say, okay, I'm going to send you friends today, knock on the door. How do, you, how do you deal with that? What's the reality there? The reality is loneliness is, is tough. It really is. Um, just as, you know, some, like, some more backstory. I mean, I was in a, a relationship for three and a half years with a woman that was not a Christian. And I had to make a, I constantly talk with my dad about, well, you know, I'm having problems with this, I'm having problems with this and this. And basically he was being as kindly as he, as he could. It was like, Nick, you're basically digging your own grave right now. So I had to make, I made a choice to end that relationship. And how I deal with loneliness is, I mean, sometimes I'm like, there, there is no like, oh, today, today I'm feeling lonely. But at the same time, 
one thing that I will tell you is the loneliest day that I have being single is going to be nothing compared to you know the best the uh, best day that I have when I'm married. You know, if I do get married, and it would be nothing compared to the you know being married to the wrong person. You know, there's just and that's that's something that I took away from my dad. Is you know, he's like Nick. If you get there's nothing like being married to the wrong person, and then if you know you get divorced, that it's the gift that keeps on giving. If you have kids, this and this and this. So I think about those things. I think about you know, yeah, I'm lonely right now, but at the same time, I know that you know, in all things, God works out for the good of those who love Him. So and it it makes it, it makes it better and. As long as you keep breathing, if you if you feel like oh you know you know I'm lonely today, as long as you keep breathing, God is going to breathe for you. Um, one of the a fascinating thing I heard from a friend of mine, uh, there was a couple, and the wife was cheated on by by her husband, and she she ran into her room and she fell down and was like, Lord, I can't breathe. And the answer that she got was, Don't worry, I will breathe for you. I think we can take a lot away from that. Um, that the days when you can't hold yourself up, the reason you're able to stand is because God stands for you. Yes, ma'am. My uh, daughter-in-law is the daughter of an Air Force person that moved around a lot in mm -hmm. her life. She was born in the Netherlands. She was brought up in California and Massachusetts and quite a few different places. So when I, when I was trying to get to know her and to establish a relationship with her, you know, the first thing that came to my mind is how do you deal with a person that's had to move around all their lives, that have dealt with a lot of loneliness, who isn't Christian? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it just made me sit and think about these people, in a sense military, mm -hmm. who are having these difficulties constantly dealing with where am I? Where am I going? Who am I going to really hold on to? And how do they really establish the relationships with other people? Yeah, there's a, and me being speedy, something I did hit on is that there are a lot of times where I'm in a room when I meet new people at church. We'll, we'll say church. So I go into a church, and one of the first questions that's asked because I'm a new person is, well, what do, what do you do? I'm in the military. Oh, <laughs> seriously, seriously, that's what happens. Uh, a big question to, to ask, like, knowing that, a question I would have is, you know, when a new person walks into Christ Church, what happens? You know, if it's, if it's anything like the experiences I've had, it's, you know, unless they're, like, I'm going to, like, me, I'm going to go to church, I don't care if no one talks to me, I'm going to be there. This is about me and God, not about all these other people. You know what I'm saying? You know, not, again, not, again. And that's and pretty rare. That, I would, again, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't start there. I remember, I know going into a, a church, to say that their main goal is, uh, you know, Yes, to get closer to the Lord. I absolutely agree. That's a lot, that's a lot of the reasons people start coming to church. Is yeah, you know, there's something about it. I want to know God, this or this. But they would be kidding themselves if they didn't say, "Well, it's also because I want to meet a person. I want to have a friend." So if a new person walks through the door and it's not like if if there's not a concerted effort to be like, "I want to have a conversation with that person," not just the "Hey, good morning. How was the drive here?" Next person, good morning, but uh, okay, I know that this person's new, I'm going to make sure I have a conversation with them that lasts more than two seconds. I think that's, that's huge, and with the person in the military, that's what has to happen, is it has to, you have to genuinely care about that person. And as far as, I mean, you're dealing with the loneliness when you move, it's just, you know, if more churches were like, were concerned with, you know, the Oh, well, oh man, you've moved everywhere. Well, while you're here, if you need anything, come talk to me. That's interesting because my cousins um, are physically, they live in Vermont, mm -hmm. and you know, Norwich Academy. And I know that's not a strict, but I mean, it's a quasi. Sure. And, and 
their church actually reaches out to the kids mm -hmm. and they come to their house on Sundays. They're allowed to take off the uniforms for the first I mean, because they have to go everywhere in uniform mm -hmm. and they can bring their jeans there, they can sit down, they eat dinner, they watch a game, they play games, they just talk. And mm -hmm. and my cousins love it because yeah. you know, my cousins are older and, and their kids are grown and they just you know and they, they have such a nice relationship with people and I have a friend whose daughter's going there, and she was interested in it, and then one of her friends said, oh, that's weird, people don't do that. And I was, I was heartbroken, and so was her mom, because we just thought it would be a really great thing for Tori to you know, meet up with my cousins and mm -hmm. with other people. And yeah. So it's interesting that people have that perception. And I'm kind of um, taken aback by People reacting to I'm in the military. I, I would think, that, <laughs> yeah. you know, I guess I'm not easy, but, but you see so much. I mean, you know, you see so much public appreciate. I mean, you won't get this because you're way too young. But I mean, when I was in college, I mean, you know, the Vietnam War was ending, and it was, mm -hmm. it was awful. I mean, just awful. <coughs> and I, I see it way different now, but. I was taken aback by that when you first told me. I'm like, <coughs> you, uh, that's like going into a room and saying, you, I mean, it's, it's people so ask me, what do I do? I'm a priest. It's so, but you, you get the thank you for your service, and then. It ends. Uh, yeah. Wow. Um, and it's, what can be difficult is where. I mean, it may it may just be where I live. Paducah is a small town. It's almost it sounds so close to Podunk that it, you know, it's like a stereotype and this. Um, you go into I go into the church and you have very very tight knit community. Um, and then I, you know I come in and it's like, well, how do you enter into a group of people that are already like like this or like brother and sister? And if you're going to try and do that by you know when you only see them once, maybe twice a week. How do you develop, it's diff very, very difficult to develop a friendship on that, which is why it's normal that the people I work with for eight hours, I'm f like, you are, they're forced to talk to me, they're forced to interact with me and I them. So what do I, what do, I do about that? Because these are, these are the problems. These are the things you run into. And, you know, I'm not saying that I'm, I'm not perfect at it by any stretch of the imagination, but I know I'm not the only person that, that deals with these problems. Mm -hmm. I know I'm not. I, I was just very surprised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's the pits. Any other questions, comments? I would just think it isn't because you're military, it's because you're transient. Military come and go. Oh, yeah, and yeah. So you don't, he, you don't want to risk getting into a relationship or starting something and then have you go off to your next post. Yeah, that would that, 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 that definitely, I would absolutely agree that's, that has to be a reason. Mm -hmm. But my, you know, playing devil's advocate, mine at the same time, I'm like, well, you don't even know me. You don't know anything about me. <laughs> and you don't care to. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So It could be because you're young, too. They don't know how to talk to somebody else. Yeah. Then it's older people. Yeah. And knowing that, that should say a lot about, okay, well, when a new person comes in, I know that this is how Nick feels. I guarantee people probably feel the same. <laughs> people probably feel the same way as I do. Like, well, who's going to talk to me? Is someone going to actually care about who I am? Are they going to actually want to know about me? Maybe they're looking to finally be able to talk to someone. If you aren't ready and willing to go and talk to them, despite whatever values, things, whatever they have, they may never come back. They may never be like, well, that was, I thought God was telling me something, but he wasn't. Because I had that experience here. Just when I was a, 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 it was Lisa Wiley, it was like the one person that actually talked to me. And mm -hmm. I was like, I, I remember that because it was, everybody else was in that boat. Yeah. So. And see, I think I have the exact opposite because I came from Good Shepherd and mm -hmm. I know we were all, I mean, we were very tight there mm -hmm. and very small. And for all of us to come into this big church, a lot of us were unsure of how it would go. And 
I can tell you now, I can't even, you know, I'll talk to somebody like Erica and go, could she come over from Good Shepherd with me? Like, I can't even remember. We're now just, yeah. everyone was so welcoming that <laughs> I, I'm just wondering, like, if it's just different parts of the country, you it know, did, and maybe did. there's just different attitudes, because I just got such a different experience here moving from even one side of Fitchburg to the other. It's also, I mean, it's... <coughs> Jokingly, it's a Baptist church as well. I don't know if that I don't know anything about ever the um, denominations really, but the uh, you know it's also it's got you know it's a it's a larger I mean it's it's a larger church, but at the same at the same time, regardless of how big a church gets, if you lose sight of okay what's important, we're here to bring people to Jesus, not about you know how many baptisms do we have, how many Sunday school classes do we have. If the focus is there, not on bringing every individual to Jesus, then you're not going to have that, that unity anymore. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.